Hello and welcome to One Great History, the podcast where we talk about the great and sometimes not so great history of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm Sabrina. And we've got our producer Nick here too. Hello everybody. Uh, So usually we start out with some kind of like fun discussion questions about the topic. Um, today, is that going to be hard today, Alex? That's going to be hard. I, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anything fun to talk about because this week's topic is Winnipeg's red light districts. <laughs> and <laughs> could not think of any appropriate questions. <laughs> not a lot of relevant icebreakers there. No. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about that and kind of the surrounding scandals in the early 20th century. So I guess right off the bat, this may not be the episode for our like younger listeners. Um, not that we're going to be talking about anything like super graphic, but I suppose it's sort of a PG-13 topic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so just to, I'll do kind of a little just intro here. So sex work is obviously a super complicated topic. Um There are people who will talk about this in much more intelligent ways than we will. (laughs) But um, basically, my position on this is sort of like we all sell ourselves in one way or another, right? If you're a construction worker, you sit, uh, you sell your body in the form of labor. If you're an office worker, you sell your body in that you agree to sit your butt in front of a computer for 40 hours a week, probably thinking about things you don't really care about. So... Prostitution, I'm not saying that it is the same, right? It's different because it's bound up in all kinds of like social mores about sex and the fact that sex is for most of us, you know, a fairly intimate thing. So that makes it different. But fundamentally, sex work is another form of work. And it's exploitative in many of the same ways that all paid labor can be and is exploitative. And obviously, there's often a gray zone between consent and coercion, especially in the context of, you know, a woman in the early 20th century without a ton of other choices. So I don't want this episode to be kind of like pearl clutching about the evils of prostitution, but I'm also not going to act like it's this like great form of emancipation or empowerment. So hopefully we're just treating sex workers as people in this narrative is the goal. (laughs) (laughs) And also as workers, you know? We're not going to do like a big scandalous take on this? Well, (laughs) (laughs) we're going to talk about past big scandalous takes on it. Okay. Um, I think I can live with that. Yeah. I do also have to tell you that researching this episode has been a kind of a nightmare. (laughs) Alex, that's been every episode we've ever done. No, that's true. (laughs) Um, But primarily because of like terminology. Oh, Yeah, right. So newspapers ran a ton of stories on sex work, but they're often like very coy about what they're talking about. Um, And I was saying to Sabrina that one of my frustrations has been that there are no photographs. Like the local newspapers do not print photographs of the red light district or of sex workers. Um, And I think it may have almost been some kind of policy for whatever reason, but also just, yeah, in terms of terminology, I couldn't just go and search, you know, prostitute or red light district because they're not actually using those those terms. So here's some of the more poetic ones. Oh boy. Um, For sex workers, languid ladies of the red glim variety. (laughs) Lady too long. Yeah, that's too, (laughs) Lady X is shorter and kind of cute. Um, this, this one comes, not surprisingly, from a religious figure. Leprous libertines who... Judas Judas. Also too long. Yeah. Um, but I would say, actually, the most typical term for sex workers working out of brothels is confusingly inmates. I feel like that says a lot. Yeah, so... Out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, we typically use that now, right, to refer to prison inmates, but... If I use it throughout this episode, that's what I mean, is sex workers. Okay. Um, brothels also, tons of different words for them. Houses of ill repute, houses of ill fame, body houses, and often just like the houses on whatever street. And you're just supposed to kind of know. <laughs> it's like no one thought about the poor historian a hundred years later trying to cobble this together. <laughs> like, how dare they? <laughs> No, I had a nightmare trying to find one particular article that I knew existed because they had done all that where they used weird terminology 
and they had spelled the street name wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, I find the like incorrect spelling might be one of the harder parts in everything I've done. It happens a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, that aside, so, um, we spoke in my prohibition episodes, so that's a couple episodes back, a lot about like early Winnipeg. So, I don't want to go over all of that again, but just to kind of set the scene here, we're basically at the turn of the century and Winnipeg is growing absurdly quickly, right? There are huge influxes of immigration. And actually James Gray points out in his book on um, prostitution that migration to Western Canada is almost unprecedented in terms of like speed and numbers. Um, And also in that it's voluntary migration, right? So (laughs) most of the time when we see like big migration events, it's, forced right so um winnipeg is also transitioning very quickly from being kind of like a rowdy gross frontier town to a more cosmopolitan urban center but still Uh, a little gross yes yes totally (laughs) yeah which means that there are like a lot of people intent on winnipeg being like less rough and rowdy than it has been but it kind of still is that (laughs) (laughs) great yeah and there's this like contradiction right at the heart of winnipeg is that it's like at once wild but also kind of pearl clutchy yeah so like one example is that as we're going to discuss in detail here um at the turn of the century we had a red light district which a lot of people were fine with but we didn't have streetcars running on sundays so you have to walk to the brothel on the sunday (laughs) yeah exactly because you know that's how the lord would want it um the prairies are also still majority male in most of the time period that we're talking about so across the prairie provinces in 1910 there were about 700,000 men and 500,000 women so that might be contributing something to the kind of rough and rowdy nature here (laughs) probably (laughs) yeah and So Winnipeg's first red light district pops up almost immediately as Winnipeg begins to grow, actually, on um, what's now Colony Street. So it's kind of largely tolerated but ignored. And actually, in fact, one of Winnipeg's early chiefs of police, J.S. Ingram, is fired by the city after being caught in a Colony Street brothel. Um, and I think the the issue there is almost not so much that he, you know, allowed it to exist, right? But just that, like, he was so dumb as to be caught going there. So that's kind of, I think, the attitude. The story I had at least heard and then told about that is that his two constables may have conspired the raid in part to spite him. <laughs> I didn't look too much into it, so I believe that. Because the police force was about three to four people at the time. Oh, so it was Ingram and these two guys who didn't like Ingram. <laughs> Oh, man. That, I mean, that's classic. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so J.S. Ingram is fired for that. um, But another important thing, Sabrina, can you think of any important institution that happens to be on Colony Street? Uh, Do you mean our alma mater? All of our, actually, the U of W? Yes, I do. (laughs) So in 1882, Manitoba College is built at what is now the corner of um, Portage and Colony. Um. And its proximity to this colony of brothels becomes a a pretty big scandal. So I should say Manitoba College is one of the founding colleges of the U of W. So still there. Also the Um, University of Winnipeg, in case no one's familiar with that. Oh yeah, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So one of the local newspapers runs a kind of front page spread on the issue. There's accusations that students are basically stopping at the brothels on their way to and from school. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I, not, wow. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's conducive to learning. Probably what not. What kind of university student has the time? Or the money. <laughs> <laughs> so the city begins shutting down these brothels. Um, they initially give them a deadline of April 1st, which is later extended to June 1st, so that they actually have like the warm spring weather to arrange for new houses to be built outside city limits. So... Um, Wherever they go build, it won't be kind of officially approved, but they've sort of given them sort of tacit approval of like, look, if you just move, it'll be fine. Um, Well, it's outside of like the border. Yes, exactly. So apparently also the madams are not too upset about this because the college was actually causing issues for them. 
Um, so one of the madams <laughs> says, uh, we are forever being pestered by kids. Just a while ago, I had to chase a bunch of them away. We don't operate no Saturday matinee for kids here, I told them. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not too upset about being moved away from the college. Um, and they're given kind of time to do it. So most of Winnipeg's brothels in June of 1883 move out to Thomas Street, uh, which today is Minto. Um, so if you're familiar with Winnipeg and kind of downtown Winnipeg, you might know that Minto is like maybe two kilometers from Colony. <laughs> so like they really didn't go that far. But the point was that they were um, out of what were then city limits. And so city officials could basically wash their hands of the issue, right? They're like, hey, if yeah. people want to go outside the city and do whatever they want to do, go for it. And Thomas Street al is allowed to operate basically unbothered for 20 years. Wow. Yeah. And this is like pretty typical. It wasn't too weird for cities in North America or Europe to have these red light districts at this time. However, the area does become an issue because police have decided more or less to ignore the area, right? It's not within the city. Mm -hmm. What do they care? Crime runs rampant. And especially as like the city expands and envelops uh, Thomas Street, there's, you know, more people there. Uh, Streetcars are running through the area and so on. More people coming in and out. So yeah, there's a ton of crimes that come up. Uh, here's a few of them. So in 1898, a man working as a porter at one of the brothels uh, kills a man and non-fatally shoots a woman. And he's apparently allowed to sort of, or able to sort of wander around with a gun for some time before the police arrive. Wow. Yeah. That's safe. Great. Yeah. Like, it sounds like there was actually like a period of time between the first and the second shooting there as well. Like, he's kind of wandering around being a danger, right? Um. In 1899, a man who at first appears to be kind of passed out in the street is discovered to have actually been shot by someone who obviously made their escape some time ago. Um, in 1902, a young woman who claims to have been brought to Canada from the United States on false pretenses and who claims to be a piano player at a house on Thomas Street accuses a man of threatening her with a knife and of hitting her. That man is able to hide out in other Thomas Street brothels for two days before the police <laughs> find him. Wouldn't that um, also cost a lot to hide in brothels for a couple of days? Yeah, actually, maybe, hey? I mean, maybe he had friends among other people maybe. on Thomas Street, I don't know. Was piano player code for sex worker also? Is I that the sort of slang going on there? Yes. So, actually, that's interesting that you say that, um... Because there's a case a little bit later, um, I think in 1903, so about a year later, where a guy is um, brought to court for theft um, and some sex workers are brought in to testify against him um, because they had been he had been basically like waving around large amounts of money, right? And yep. what's really cool about that is that, um, so, not that the theft or anything is cool, but what's <laughs> Alex's cool about, pro robbery is what we're learning today. <laughs> what's cool about the historical record, though, is that he talks about how he spent the money that he arrived with. Oh, so yeah. So on the topic of like piano playing. So he says that he arrived at the brothel with $25, which he spent on the following one tune on the piano played by Aurora Manley for 50 cents. One bottle of beer, one dollar. One kiss from Irene Leroy, 25 cents. Um, a box of cigarettes, 25 cents. A kiss from Aurora, 25 cents. And then a large amount of money, of sort of miscellaneous, which covered the remainder. <laughs> so I do actually think that there was actual piano playing happening. But, I, mean, I guess when you think of like, a, like the Wild West saloons, there's still a piano player in them, right? Yes. So I think probably like piano player was code, but also there was piano playing happening. Yeah. I think it was probably kind of a prelude, you know? Because um, you could get a song and then a kiss from your piano player, exactly. which I don't think happens anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that kind of gives us a funny idea of like, yeah, how the kind of prelude to the actual act went, right? That like, <laughs> oh, you'd have a song, you'd have a kiss, and then you kind of move on to the action. The miscellaneous. The miscellaneous, funds. exactly, which costs the rest of all the money you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 
Um, yeah, so more in 1902, a man is accidentally shot by a woman with his own revolver. Um, he survives, he's fine, but he is subsequently charged for carrying a loaded gun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a bad day to be accidentally shot with your own gun and then charged for it, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's the worst outcome is that you die, but this (laughs) is also not a good outcome. (laughs) This is true. This is a more fun one. Um, Again, in 1902, a policeman is distracted by other kind of goings on on Thomas Street and two young men stole his horse's robe. (laughs) I guess, like, presumably police horses wore kind of a a jacket. (laughs) How else they know they're police horses, Alex? I guess. And they stole it um, and were caught when they outfitted their own horse with it, it seems. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, what would you do with a horse's robe besides put it on your own horse? Yeah. Yeah, they had this whole weird story about how their horse's robe got lost or something. So they needed a new one. So they thought, let's steal this one. <laughs> okay. But in any case, so even when crimes aren't committed, like in Thomas Street, it seems to also be where the criminals go. So there's that case with the guy who spent the money on the piano playing. Um, There's another case where a guy is um, brought to court after having kind of been like waving around a bunch of money in brothels. Um, He claimed that he had found said money and he was accused of having, in fact, stolen it. Um, So... As we can see, these crimes are kind of ramping up, right? And so this is when people, particularly the clergy, begin calling for Thomas Street to be shut down. So what seems to bring things to a head is a very odd story in late 1903. A man named John Gates claims that his seven-year-old son, Henry, had been shot at by two drunk men on Thomas Street, who fortunately missed due to their drunkenness, and he was able to escape home. Now, his mother claims to have seen this happen through the window, but no police investigation is made. Now, that's perhaps partly because John Gates didn't actually report the incident to the police, but instead went straight to the press. Uh. Oh. Yeah. And so Chief of Police McRae actually calls the story a total fabrication. Um, And he Hmm. calls into question the character of the dad. So he's saying that basically that just didn't happen. He doesn't believe it. Now, I don't know if it did or not, um, but people kind of latch on to this story. And so in sermons and letters to the editor, people are expressing their anger, not only at the kind of apparent attempted murder, which happened of a child, but also at Chief McRae for failing to investigate. Hmm. Um, I should say, by the way, that uh, Chief McRae is the police, the chief of police throughout basically this entire episode. He was in that job for quite a while. Um, I, I've grown to sort of love him throughout this research because in every <laughs> quote, he just sounds annoyed. He just sounds so annoyed. He's like, can people just let me do my job? <laughs> and the answer is always a resounding no. No. <laughs> I do have to say, making up a fake child endangerment story is very, like, clergy in early Winnipeg. Yeah. So Every I, time they have a cause, they're like, here's a sad child. <laughs> Yeah, so whether or not it happened, like, honestly, there's no evidence either way. Yeah. Um, but it it does seem a little weird to me that you wouldn't go to the police. And when they ask him why he didn't, he's like, oh, they just, like, never listened to me. Which, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but, like, then had he gone to the police before? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so it's very strange. But in any case, people latch on to that. Um, and so people are beginning to complain a lot more vocally about the area and residents are complaining also that now that streetcars are running to the area that cars full of drunk men are pulling up into their neighborhood every night like we have to remember whenever we're talking about these districts that they're not only made up of brothels right Mm -hmm. that there are people who live in these neighborhoods and have to deal with you know with people who are coming in and out you know that's not fun Uh, This is just a fun story I found in 1903, um, speaking of kind of reformers, a reverend and faith healer called, I'm not joking, Father Christmas (laughs) is going to be in Winnipeg in December (laughs) and plans to visit the Thomas Street brothels and individually invite all the sex workers to a public meeting, which he will hold. 
So he had apparently healed people of deafness and diseases in the past and was planning on basically putting on kind of a lecture or something. What and was he trying to heal the sex workers from? <laughs> themselves? <laughs> from sin? I don't know. <laughs> He So he claimed that most of the young women were anxious to lead better lives and had been led there by false promises of young men. And he believed that most of them would show up to his um, to his performance. Do you have um, any idea how that turned out? I don't. I, I just could not face the prospect of trying to search for Father Christmas and <laughs> trying yeah. to find the actual meeting. <laughs> So I don't know if it even happened. I doubt that many of them showed up, though. Um, <laughs> so a citizens committee is formed. Um, they try to make a meeting with the police commissioners. So this board of police commissioners are the ones who kind of make decisions about law enforcement. And they basically brush off this committee. They kind of ask them at first, like, well, like, who's part of your committee? And like, OK, well, we'll set something up at some point. And then they just actually never do it. <laughs> OK. Um, which is a hilarious way of dealing with an issue. Um, <laughs> Chief McRae. Like for government. Yeah. Yeah. The classic brush off, right? Of your concerned citizens. Um, Chief McRae, though, begins saying that he would empty out the houses just as soon as he had the permission to do so from the police commission, which I think is a pretty interesting change because previously he's been kind of like, yeah, it's fine. Um, so in late 1903, the commission do eventually meet uh, with the Citizens Committee, but they promise very little. And in November, there are huge meetings at a number of locations, including uh, the Winnipeg Theatre and the Westminster Church. They're absolutely packed, like standing room only, with a ton of citizens and clergy who want to stamp out vice. So the chairman of the meeting explains that he of the this is the Winnipeg theater meeting. He explains that he believes an agreement had been reached between madams and police some 20 years prior that their houses would be left alone if they stayed in this kind of marginal area, um, though he admits that there is no kind of written statement proving this accusation. And actually, I think he's probably right with that claim. Um, I think there probably was some kind of agreement that, OK, if you move away from the new college, we'll kind of leave you alone. Um, and he says, what has been the result? From that day until this, we have had what is known as the Thomas Street Colony. That colony has grown until there are at least 11 or 12 houses devoted entirely to this vice. Now, who are these respectable women, in brackets, laughter, who <laughs> occupy these houses? Are they our people? Are they Canadians? At least 75% of this population are people who have come from the South because this is a quiet place for them to pursue their calling. So this is where we start to see one of the big kind of real issues here, which is, are these foreigners? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it seems to be a real like, well, we don't want these immigrants here. It's very much that. So by um, the South, they presumably mean America, right? Yes. Yeah. So they're... Yeah, it's it's odd that they're so afraid of Americans coming in. But it's yeah, pretty low on the list of like usual immigrant concerns you see in Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. But um, there there are in fact sex workers who come up from the United States, and some of them presumably because um, you know there there's an established district here. Um, he also says if the devil came to Winnipeg as mayor, he could not support vice any better than it is supported by those now in power. <laughs> wow um there's also a real like think of the children aspect here <laughs> says uh of course yeah there is not a man who comes to this city who um but knows of these houses of vice on thomas street the young boys and the young girls growing up know about it and among themselves they discuss the doings there and ask their mothers for further particulars about the customs on this street i feel like kids have other priorities yeah, and like I mean, really dwelling <laughs> that hard. <laughs> I don't know. I guess probably kids do ask their parents, like, whatever, who's that woman? What does she do? But kids have all kinds of tough questions, right? Yeah, they also make it seem like this is going to be a kid's devoted passion is to uncover the truth. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, they also say that because the houses are kind of outside of like the city proper, like the core of the city, men are less afraid of going there because they're not afraid of being seen. And that's funny because a few years earlier, the concern had been, well, we don't want this in the city. 
Now they're saying, oh, that it's outside of the city is a problem because it's like too huh. secret. Um, and basically they say that, well, the police could control this if they wanted and they're just not. So after this, there is also um, a, num- a city council meeting um, about a resolution possibly to shut down the brothels. And this, this sounds like actually a crazy city council meeting. Like there's actual screaming. Oh, wow. Um So Alderman Wells, this is an odd statement, is in favor of the resolution. Um, He says it's a very difficult issue. Um, He says the general impression among the council members is that to drive the colony off the street would only be to aggravate the evil. Let the council take this action, and if its end is failure, the citizens will then not blame the council, but the ministerial association. So what he's saying is we should pass this resolution, shut down the red light district, and then it won't work. But then people (laughs) will realize how dumb they were to think it would work, essentially, and they'll blame the ministers. So they'll blame the church instead of the city. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I guess that's an argument to do it. It's not a good one. No, it's not a good reason to do things. Um, To which the mayor responds pretty um, tersely. The ministerial association is not running things here. (laughs) Um, Alderman Russell, with face flaming, leaps to his feet. (laughs) That's that's a quote from the Tribune. Um, Of course it is. Yep. He says, I have no sympathy for the persecution which which the ministerial association is inflicting on these women. Persecution which could not be exceeded by devils. Why do they persecute the women and let the men that drag them down uh, to a life the most shameful a woman can live walk the streets free? Um, So he's basically saying that um, he doesn't think this resolution is fair because it punishes the women and not the men who visit. Which actually is quite a, a modern take. Yeah. Um, but I don't know why he's yelling about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just strong feelings. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, though, a decision is made um, to raid the Thomas Street brothels. Um, and it's made in quite a bit of secrecy, actually. So Chief McRae doesn't tell even the other, like, even his police constables about it until that day. Oh, wow. To, yeah, to avoid the word getting out, right? Because he wants to find all of these these women at home. So the morning of January 11th, um, 15 uh, so-called hacks, so those are basically, um, you know, carriages um, are brought. 89 people are arrested. That's 85 um, women and four men um, on a Saturday morning. And they are all arrested and brought into court together. Now, there's apparently like a big... Um, a big crowd that almost like keeps them from making their way from there uh, to the um, to the police station. There's a crowd about the Tribune claims about three thousand people, which sounds insane to me. Um, yeah, but, that seems pretty high. Yeah, but I guess people notice pretty quickly that like fifteen police cars basically have showed up right at the Thomas Street brothels and are arresting everyone in sight. So there is a big crowd, and they're actually kind of jeering. Like, people have been calling for this to be shut down, but these people who show up don't seem happy about what's happening. And so, um, just about all of these people who are arrested are brought into court together, where the madams are charged $40 and the inmates were charged $20, so totaling over $2,200 in total. Um and Magistrate Daly essentially informs them all that the colony is being broken up and that he is giving them the lightest possible penalty with the understanding that they'll cooperate with this turn of events. Um, there's also this funny bit in the Tribune where it talks about how a lot of them are wearing like amazing hats and fashions. Like apparently <laughs> they they look up showing very nice. Um, and, and he, and, like, are very casual about this, apparently, a lot of them. They're kind of, like, laughing in court and stuff. It sounds like an interesting day in the courthouse, for sure. Um, But, despite their kind of casualness on that day, many aren't sure what to do after this. They didn't have the money to travel elsewhere, a lot of them, which is what they're told, right? They're told to basically find other work or to leave town. Um, And they're unlikely to find other work in the city. Um, 
And one of the things that I have a huge issue with here is that the Tribune talks about this rather sympathetically, that they're like, oh, these like women won't be able to find other work. They also print a public list of all of the people arrested. Oh, no. So, of course, they can't find work because everyone course. knows their names. Yeah. So, like, Jeez. the next day you're going to go somewhere and, like, the person before, like, the day before read this list, right, on the front page of the paper and saw your name. That might be an issue for you. <laughs> Um, yeah, that might cause problems. Yeah. But in any case, so that's done. Although the police commission and the mayor actually refused to divulge the specifics of the order that led to those raids, which is interesting. Oh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, afterwards, um, the police report that the houses are quiet. So um, sex work is done in Winnipeg after this point, right? <laughs> this just stops it. Oh, oh yeah. That's the end of the episode now. <laughs> 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 and actually, a couple days later, the Tribune prints um, an article saying these women need support. Many of the Thomas Street inmates are now destitute and need food. Several of them obliged to sleep in stables on straw, refused by hotels. Maybe because you printed their names <laughs> in the paper. <laughs> but basically, it says that many of them had already moved to walking the streets. Which I think is surprising to no one, right? Yeah, um, I don't know what they thought was going to happen at the end of this. Like, no, they're not. They're not setting the women up with like other jobs. It's just like you can't work <laughs> here anymore. You have no other recourse. Absolutely not. I Goodbye. think like, even today, as a former sex worker, it would be super hard to find another job because you won't have you know references. You won't have a resume with a kind of normal work history on it. But in 1904, yeah. I can't imagine. And also it, someone's essentially tweeted out all of your names to the entire city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in March, Chief McRae confirms that the houses remain closed. Um, he also asks for more constables to kind of help keep that state of affairs. Um, but let's kind of pause here for a second and talk about pe why people were suddenly so upset and having these huge, like, packed Westminster church meetings about brothels when apparently they had been fine with Thomas Street for like 20 years previously, right? And also, as mm -hmm. I said, pretty common in other cities. So as with the campaign for prohibition, the move to do away with red light districts was tied to a bunch of kind of moral panic about the changing world and modernization. And specifically, right around this time, there seems to be a sudden panic throughout North America and Western Europe about so-called white slavery. Oh my god, of course it's white slavery. <laughs> so Sabrina, can you can you explain what is what is white slavery? Where have you heard this term? Um it's come up a couple of times in Canadian history courses. It's this very strange and very like anti-immigrant and racist idea that immigrants are coming in to steal white daughters and white women from their families. Yes. Whoa. So and to be honest, it's not true. No, and I've mostly mostly heard of it as a gag in old movies. No, okay, do you want to know where I'm most familiar with it, actually? Yeah. Um, in Saskatoon, in the 1920s and 30s, they got so concerned about specifically Chinese immigrants being, like, the perpetrators of white slavery that they actually banned white women from working in Chinese restaurants. Oh, wow. For fear that it was a trafficking operation. Oh, jeez. Which, huh. again, it was not. And if it was, is that really, like, they're going to be like, well, guess we can't do it anymore because they we stopped. We can't the hire them legally we anymore. <laughs> Yeah, so I've like in the movie, um, in the movie Harvey, which is my favorite movie, um, there's a bit where the main character who played by Jimmy Stewart, his aunt gets kind of taken into an insane asylum and she starts screaming about how they're like white slavers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think even like pretty soon after this panic, people are aware that this was like kind of an absurd thing to believe. But to explain it a little further, white slavery refers to what today we might call um, human trafficking. So essentially the forced prostitution of women, but specifically white women in this case. And this was a huge concern in what we call the progressive area era, this era of kind of like reform and pearl clutching. <laughs> um, and in the years before the First World War, dozens of cities throughout Canada and the U.S. started these like vice investigations and also passed laws trying to deal with this supposed issue. 
So in 1910, the U.S. passed, for example, um, the White Slave Traffic Act, uh, which is better known today as the Mann Act, which uh, forbade the transferring of women across state lines for immoral purposes. So this is not just something that like, you know, normal people are kind of worried about, like a conspiracy theory, like this is something that people are actually passing laws to deal with, even though it's probably not a thing. (laughs) And I found actually this super interesting old book published at the time um, called it's it's got the longest block of text on the front page. Of course. Uh, So it is called Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade, the Greatest Crime in World's History. Um, Really? Is this fictional crime the greatest one? (laughs) Um, Good question. They also call it. Um, the blackest slavery that has ever stained the human race. Oh. Which, yep, um, this is an American published book. It is very obvious what the worst slavery is that the U.S. has engaged in. (laughs) Jeez. But that's, anyway, besides the point. (laughs) Before we get too mad about this. Yeah. This is written by um, Edwin W. Sims. He is the man most feared by all white slave traders, apparently. He's also secretary of the Illinois Vigilance Association. And this is, according to the blurb on the front page, a complete and detailed account of the shameless traffic in young girls, the methods by which the procurers and panderers lure innocent young girls away from home and sell them to keepers of dives. The magnitude of the organization and its workings, how to combat this hideous monster, how to save your girl, in caps, how to save (laughs) your boy, what you can do to help wipe out this curse of humanity, a book designed to awaken the sleeping and protect the innocent. So this is some like 400 plus pages of cautionary tales um, and information about like how and where white slavery is supposedly occurring, complete with uh, 32 pictures. Um, Now, I did not read 400 plus pages of this, to be clear. I very much skimmed it. (laughs) Um, But this book basically says that young women are being snatched away from under um, the noses of their parents and often without um, their knowledge, which is the kind of crazy part. So, for example, in ice cream parlors, which are apparently largely run by foreigners... Um, and also in railway depots. So the typical scenario that they lay out is that an innocent young girl goes to the city on her own and is approached by a friendly seeming stranger, typically a foreigner, who offers her help in some way, say um, protection or a carriage ride to a friend's house. And then in fact, they snatch them away to live this kind of life of debauchery. And then their parents believe that the children are doing fine, but actually they're being held captive and they're too ashamed to tell their parents. So they're like writing letters home to their parents saying they're fine, but they're being held as white slaves. Hmm. And to be clear, this is not referring to women who are like out of options. Like it's saying that these women are literally slaves, that there are bars on the windows that they can't leave. And so this is what, like, SVU's idea. Yeah. Uh, 100%, <laughs> yes. This is like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so because of this belief, it's also pretty common for reformers to visit brothels trying to save women. and Which I'm sure goes over very well. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because there's a bunch of these, like, accounts of reformers who are also often women, but, like, you know, kind of middle-class women visiting brothels and then being like upset that the women don't want to leave and that they're like not having success with that. Now, of course, the issue here is that like, even if a young woman wants to leave sex work, these reformers aren't offering them, you know, a position that they can work at, right? They're just saying, hey, do you want to leave? Like, where is this sex worker supposed to now go and live and work, right? Yeah. There was a really interesting, I think it was a Manitoba Historical Society article about, like, sex work in Winnipeg. And the main argument was something like, it's hard to stop it when you don't offer supports to all of these women afterwards. Yeah. So you just say, you need to stop this. They've got nothing else. They've got no other recourse sometimes, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. And that's, as we see, what's what happens with the Thomas Street brothels is they shut them down and say, okay, stop doing that. But then how? 
right? Where do you go work? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a very simple question, but one that none of these reformers are seemingly answering. Now, in some bigger cities, they do actually make like almost like halfway houses. Oh. Where, like, yeah, where, where women can go live. But that, as far as I know, was not a thing in Winnipeg. Um, actually, Father Christmas, <laughs> the guy who we talked about before, did say that he... Um, could arrange about half a dozen domestic placements for women outside of the city, which doesn't seem that helpful. Like, that's not that many. No. And also yeah. still probably risky. I can't imagine, like, the people willing to hire a former sex worker to be their yeah. housekeeper are going to be, like, the kindest employers necessarily. That's true. They might fall into additional exploitation, right? Because yeah. they don't have a ton of other options. So why are people suddenly so worried about this, right? Is this something that is actually happening? Uh, well, like we said, probably no. Um, <laughs> so like, were women coerced into sex work in some cases? Like, certainly yes, to be clear. But typically mm. for like more complex economic reasons, not because they were physically forced. Um, there were some instances where madams did keep their girls from leaving. Um, so either because they owed them money or just because like they were a good worker and they didn't want them to. But in, in the way that these books are positing, like women were not being snatched out of ice cream parlors by foreigners. Um, and this is basically a story based on fears of modernization, right? So of urbanization, especially of women like going off from their smaller rural communities into the city and working. Um, mm -hmm. That's pretty scary. To some, to some people. Um, also big fears of immigration, obviously. Um, this was also kind of a useful story. It could be put to many uses. This was a story told both by the KKK and by the Women's uh, Christian Temperance Union, which are very like diametrically opposed um, in most ways anyway, um, organizations. Um, and also the interesting thing is that sometimes sex workers use these stories if they decide to leave the field. So if a sex worker oh. is looking to, yeah, is looking to live a more kind of quote, respectable life, she might claim that she had been in fact forced into this life, right? And that's a way of her kind of regaining that respectability. Does um, that story work if you're not white? <laughs> good question, right? <laughs> I don't know. So if it wasn't white slavery that was creating these districts, what was it, right? Like who was actually becoming sex workers? So unfortunately, most of what we know comes from things like arrest records and court mm -hmm. testimonies, which don't tell a full story. Um, but we can tell a few things. So um, almost all um, in the Winnipeg districts were female. Um, most of them were young. The average age was about 25, 26 for workers um, and about 27 or 28 for brothel keepers, okay. um, which is quite young, actually, I think. To yeah. And like basically just there were very few economic opportunities for young women. And this was a chance at financial security mm -hmm. um, and even a chance in some cases at like moving up a kind of, you know, the financial ladder because many madams were former sex workers who eventually earned enough to buy their own houses. Mm -hmm. um, and a sex worker could make, you know, something like four times what she might make as a cook or a maid or a seamstress. Um, we know that this is, you know, not all that long before the Winnipeg general strike. So obviously people, including young women, are struggling with low wages. And also long hours and poor working conditions everywhere. Yeah, so, like, this might not have been the worst option, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also some sex, wor sex workers were hiding out, either because they were, say, wanted for a crime in another city or because they were escaping, um, say, an abusive partner. Um, the women were multi-ethnic, so th this kind of is one of the downfalls of the white slavery thing. So there were women from Canada, the U.S., Europe, Africa, Asia, just about everywhere. Um, brothels interestingly tended to be grouped together by place of origin. So, oh. yeah. So partly if, I think for reasons just of like language. So there were a mm. number of like French speaking brothels, 
Um, one that was um, a number of Norwegian women, I think one with a number of Japanese women. So it's just easier in that way. But I think um, also for purposes of community and in that way, mm-hmm. working at a brothel could also be a way of like adjusting to a new place with people who, you know, were familiar to you. Mm-hmm. Um, religious backgrounds were also pretty varied, um, as was marital status. So most women were single, but about 25% were actually married. Oh, Um, And about 65% of madams were married. Um, Mm. Though that isn't to say that they were necessarily living with their husbands. Yeah. Um, As we say, sometimes, you know, they may have been escaping said husband. Divorce was a lot harder back then. Um, Pimps were also fairly unusual in segregated districts. So like essentially essentially male brothel keepers, right? Quite unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is another downfall of this like white slavery myth because... These are supposed to be foreign men who are snatching women away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for security instead, madams usually hired private detectives who might work for multiple houses and could be called by a whistle if something had gone wrong. Okay, actually, here's a weird anecdote. You know, Alex will know this. Nick, you might not. There's a series <laughs> of like Winnipeg murder mystery novels by Adam Levine. Mm. The background of the main character in those books is that he was a private detective for a brothel. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was like That's a really common... niche tie in. <laughs> yeah. That is a pretty common, though, I think, like actual job for detectives from these agencies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And they weren't um, always sex workers weren't always the only ones who lived in these houses. They typically employed um, cooks who were often um, black women or Chinese men, um, sometimes domestic servants as well. So in this way, also like becoming a sex worker could be a way to enjoy things that you otherwise had a very slim chance of enjoying as like a lower class woman, right? Mm -hmm. Things like having a cook and nice clothes and, you know, even a servant. Um, But that being said, it was not a fun way to live. Alcoholism and drug addiction were both issues as was violence, right? From John's unwanted pregnancy Mm -hmm. um, and STIs. It was pretty common for women to spend time in the hospital periodically. Um, one madam, Edna Hamilton said that she brought a doctor in to examine the women in her house once a week to make sure that everyone was okay. So, you know, can be a pretty dangerous lifestyle for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, they tended to be transient. So women came and went for different reasons. Um, some due to illness, some just left the, the field, went and worked elsewhere if they could. Uh, some of them left to go elsewhere because they didn't like their madam. Just like, you know, you leave a, you know, you leave a bad boss, right? Yeah. Um, it was also interestingly fairly common to leave town to avoid testifying in court against other women. Oh. Yeah. So prior to a couple of these raids, actually, there are like complete brothels that just like leave town. Hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so back to kind of Winnipeg specific stuff here in the intervening years after the brothel street raids. What happens is kind of what you might expect. Um, Prostitution doesn't end. It just spreads across the city. Um, In 1904, in February, uh, women, so this is just a month after they've shut down. Women are already moving to other areas, as noted in the papers. And Chief McRae, again, annoyed, explains that there isn't much he can do. And basically, this is the result of shutting down Thomas Street. Like, what did you expect is the feeling I get from him. (laughs) Um, we do know that other brothels are set up because of arrest records. So in 1904, a man staying at a brothel on Pacific Avenue actually assaults a police officer, which allows police to search the home, leading to the arrest of, um, Ethel Doyle, who's a fairly prominent madam, and Jesse Shaw. Um, they're sentenced to two and three months in prison, which is quite severe. Um, Mm -hmm. And there is kind of increasingly discussion as the years pass about the best solution to prostitution. And many, including aldermen and police commissioners, believe it would be another Thomas Street. But nothing at this point had been done. And again, as these kind of houses are creeping into different neighborhoods, there are all these citizens meetings about the so-called social evil. Now, in 1909, residents of Rachel Street, which is today Annabella, begin to notice something strange and report their suspicions to the Tribune. So that article reads, has segregation been decided on? 
Rachel Street said to have been purchased by women of easy virtue. Owners hear this report. Is Rachel Street to become like old Thomas Street, the headquarters of the painted ladies of the city? Okay, again, please just tell me what you're actually talking about. I can't, I can't search painted ladies. <laughs> anyway, reports say so. An investigation amongst the property owners of that street seemed to confirm the reports. So at this point, the entire east side of Rachel Street had nearly been purchased. And the owners were more or less naming whatever price they wanted for these houses. Um, and most of the owners were pretty happy to sell because um, a gas works had recently been built there and it was kind of making everything pretty dirty. But at this point, it was unclear who had bought up this entire row of houses. There was a real estate agent named John Beeman who had actually conducted all the purchases, but he wasn't connected with any local real estate offices. Hmm. And so far, they hadn't seen the actual buyers. But there are rumors that ladies of easy virtue were the real purchasers. Now, some evidence of this, of course, is just the inflated pricing, right? And the purchase of all these streets at once. Mm -hmm. um, but also some women had visited the street and kind of inspected the houses like from their carriages. So like without leaving their carriage, kind of looking at the houses. Um, also a woman um, known as Diamond Lil, who was quite an infamous madam, had apparently visited the street several times. So I think this might be on the part of the, the sellers of these houses, kind of willful ignorance, right? That they're able to sell these houses for like, in some cases, you know, eight, 10 times what they're actually worth. Oh my God. Yeah. Like these are, a lot of these are essentially shacks, but you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're selling houses that are worth, you know, $1,500 for like $12,000. Um, now, one funny thing is that a, a couple of days after that article is published about these suspicions, someone writes a very angry letter to the editor. Um, this is a resident of Rachel Street saying, sir, by what right do you publish such a paragraph in, in such bold capitals as was in your paper last night regarding Rachel Street? While respectable people are living in that street and in its neighborhood, by what right do you publicly do you publicly uh, do you, okay, this is confusing phrasing, sorry. By what right do you <laughs> public the names of the people living on that street and in its neighborhood? Are you so anxious for copy that you must rake up the rumors of such rottenness and drag other people's names into your theme? Rachel Street, besides being one of the most orderly streets in the city, has also a class of people that resent such publicity as you have striven to give them and will thank you in the future to send your reporters elsewhere. So I this find that kind of ironic considering where we all, I think, know the story is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's someone who just like didn't believe that what they said was happening or like did believe it and just didn't want their kind of street talked about in that way either way. <laughs> but obviously either way found this a very embarrassing thing to be happening to their neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, so there's a meeting of the um, the infamous Ministerial Association, who, of course, were kind of more or less responsible for the 1904 raids. Um, so they named that real estate agent, Mr. Beeman. Um, they've apparently confronted the mayor, who has said that the power was now vested in the police commissioners alone. So he's basically saying, I have nothing to do with this. Oh, wow. So the mayor's just sworn this off. Yes. He's saying, this is nothing to do with me. I told the police commissioners to deal with it. <laughs> um, but the Ministerial Associ Association are trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, at least one delegate believes that the authorities know what is happening. Um, and interestingly, one of them says, if segregation were to be allowed, it should be in a portion of the city where people were better off and would be able to protect themselves from it and banish it, rather than in one of the poorer districts, as was proposed. And I find that mm. interesting because I think often, right, these districts are placed in poorer neighborhoods. But it's yeah. also this funny moralistic idea of like, well, rich people can resist bad things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Is it that like the rich people are less likely to frequent the brothel? Is I that guess, the argument? I'm not sure. It's strange. <laughs> um, so a Point Douglas resident. So that's the area that Rachel Street is in. Um, says that he has gone to the police commissioners along with other residents and they are told in a bland and, and sympathetic manner, we know nothing about it. 
Um, and that the police also profess ignorance and say that if they believe such a thing is happening, that they should simply supply evidence, which would lead to a conviction. Um, so they're basically, the police and the police commissioners and the mayor at this point are all saying, we have no idea what's happening. Like, so we don't know about technically this. technically in charge of this then? So, great question. <laughs> like, basically, it's becoming very obvious, right, that this is, in yeah. fact, another red light district, just despite all these denials. Um, and actually, the area peaks at 58 houses. So, like, this is not all that kind of secret. But anyway, so it's becoming pretty obvious. Um, by the way, typically a house had between one and six women uh, working. I think I had like a mental image of like much bigger brothels. Yeah. But four, four is the average number of women working at a brothel. And they typically also lived there. Um, and this becomes also a place to go and sightsee. So it's easily accessible by streetcar from downtown. And so a lot of people go like not, not actually to visit the brothels, but just to like look at them. <laughs> Um, and yeah, again, it's pretty obvious that there are um, sex workers here at this point. Um, they typically wore kind of heavier makeup than was kind of usual for women of the time. And they wore brightly, brightly colored kimonos as like oh. a way of distinguishing themselves. Um, but residents do begin to complain. Now, at this point, like the cops and the government still have not copped to this being anything to do with them or even existing. But people are starting to complain. Um, the biggest issue is not actually the sex workers or the brothels themselves, but the men who are coming into the neighborhood to visit them. Mm. So residents complain, especially about like men approaching women and girls on the streets, sometimes even exposing themselves. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Or like knocking on their doors, asking if like, this is the brothel essentially. Um, there's even uh, one case in which a woman has her home barged into by three men and is very nearly assaulted. I won't go into detail about that, but it sounds super horrifying and not fun. So um, was there no way to tell which house was a brothel and which one wasn't? Great question. I'll tell you why it wasn't in, in a minute. Okay. <laughs> but, but the short answer is not, not really. Okay. Um, but yeah, basically, there's a bunch of crimes being committed. Drunkenness is also a big issue. Um, so because of the huge mortgage payments on these, madams basically have to sell alcohol to make money. Um, so at a meeting in June, suggestions by residents include a shotgun, a tar and feather celebration, and the burning of the objectionable houses. Now, none of that is very nice, but just to illustrate people's unhappiness about the state of affairs here. Who are so, they planning on tarring and feathering just everyone? I don't know. Like one person is the it like women, a, the women, the Johns. Uh, I don't know. The mayor, the mayor, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, so tons of resident complaints about this new kind of red light district, which has pretty obviously been set up. But the city government seems pretty happy to just kind of ignore that <laughs> <laughs> until until in 1910. Reverend Shearer, who's the general secretary for the Moral and Social Reform Council of Canada, makes a statement to several national newspapers claiming that Winnipeg has the rottenest condition in connection with the question of social vice to be found in any city in Canada. <laughs> so basically, he's like publicly roasting Winnipeg. So he claims that there are 53 houses uh, with 250 sex workers. Um, that they abide by certain rules uh, put in place for them by the police, including not playing the piano too loudly, not making too much noise, not having white female cooks, and not soliciting from the windows and doors. Wait, no white female cooks? Nope, that's a weird one. I, <laughs> I can't explain it. I'm assuming it's going back around to, like, white slavery again, but in a way I can't quite figure out. No, I can't quite figure it out either, because why can you work as a sex worker, but not as a cook in a brothel? I don't know. Huh. I don't know. I have questions. He also claims that they're selling illegal liquor and that they pay a hundred dollar fine every three months and then they're not bothered about it. And of course, that the area is a bastion of white slavery. No, nah, there we go. Of course. Um, he also points out basically that the law hasn't actually been changed. So even if the police choose to ignore it, sex work is still illegal, right? 
So in yeah. 1910, largely in response to Reverend Shearer's comments, there is a royal commission on charges regarding vice and of graft against the police. So this is an investigation basically into Shearer's claims, which like residents have been making for months, but apparently this is what gets it done, right? Okay, sure. So the commission finds that um, some of the headlines were exaggerated, but that Dr. Shearer's statements were overall accurate. Um, they actually get him to clarify that he doesn't suspect the police of corruption, except in as much as they are allowing the area to exist. So basically that no one had been bribing the police. Um, and the commission finds that no law exists which would allow this, but that police commissioners admit at this point that they had brought about a condition of affairs at variance with the principle of the common law. So what had happened actually, according to the commission? Basically, um, so T. Main Daly, we met him back in 1904 when he shut down Thomas Street. He had written mm -hmm. a letter in April of 1909 um, pointing out that conditions were worse. So this is to the city council, essentially, pointing out that conditions were worse now than they had been during the time of Thomas Street, leading to immorality and venereal diseases. Um, the Board of Police Commissioners is then basically told by City Council that they're to deal with this. So City Council essentially washes their hands of this. So they tell the Board of Police Commissioners, who then um, pass the buck again, they pass a re resolution referring the whole matter to the Chief of Police with instruction to act in according with his best judgment. So Chief McRae is stuck again. <laughs> yes. Poor <laughs> Chief McRae is once again... <laughs> given responsibility for figuring out this issue for the entirety of the city of Winnipeg. No one else wants to take responsibility for it. No, but he says it was their intention that I would bring about new conditions by these, um, by these women getting into one locality by themselves. So I think they sort of officially say in the paperwork, like, okay, this is the pol police chief's responsibility. Now he can just like do whatever he feels like, but it's made pretty clear to him that what they're saying is set up a red light district. Okay. So McRae had then gone to Minnie Woods, who was a prominent madam in Winnipeg. She was kind of, um, like, had been around for quite some time. Was and Minnie Woods he, the one that was, like, the queen of the brothel? Was that her nickname? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think she may also be the one who's called, like, the wicked... No, I can't remember. Anyway. But, um, yeah, she's been around for quite a while. She is in the business for, like, 30 years or something crazy like that. Um, so he actually shows her this resolution and asks her if it would be possible to get everyone into one area. And so together they choose Rachel and McFarland streets. So this is interesting because this is basically like, this is city planning. Yeah. So Sabrina, maybe, can you explain what Point Douglas is, which is where Rachel street was? So Point Douglas is a neighborhood in Winnipeg that's like just north of the Exchange District in Winnipeg. So it's sort of like a more immigrant based neighborhood from what I understand, a little more working class. It's behind the CPR station. It's near a lot more of like the factories and the warehouses. Yeah. So it's where it working of, families live. Yes, it's where working families live. It's kind of away from prominent areas. It also kind of juts out right into yeah. the area of the river, which gives it kind of natural seclusion. It's like, yeah, near downtown, but not quite in it. Somewhat secluded. It's easy to get car. to from downtown. Exactly. It's got streetcar access. Um, and yeah, as you said, near to the CPR station and a number of hotels. So I can see actually why they chose this area. Um, and McRae had then, after they made this decision, uh, sent along this real estate agent, John Beeman, to help make the purchases. Because obviously, if Madam starts showing up on the street actually making these purchases, that's not likely to go over that well. Um, and then he gave them rules. So um, they were not to parade the streets. They were not to go uptown. Um, apparently, they, if they wanted to go uptown, they were supposed to call the police and let them know, which is kind oh. of weird. Yeah. Okay. Odd, hey? Like if they wanted to go shopping, they'd have to call Chief McRae and be like, hey, we're going down to wherever. <laughs> um, basically just not to be like generally disorderly. 
and also that the nature of these houses was not to be visible from the outside. Hmm. So uh, Madam Lila Anderson says we had we had uh, not to have any lights or anything suggesting of soliciting. Our house was supposed to be the same as any private house and we were not to have any bright lights or make any noise or have any music or anything of that kind. So so it's no wonder people break into random houses then. Well, exactly. And I can see the intention here of like, okay, we're allowing red light district, but we don't want it to be like disruptive to the neighborhood. Yeah. But then, yes, I think that probably is part of the reason they're having this continued problem of men barging into the wrong houses or soliciting the wrong women right Mm -hmm. um madams were responsible for keeping these rules which can't have been easy um yeah so like i said they would uh often kind of phone the police to keep them updated on things so like the fact that the police were denying knowledge of this is pretty ridiculous actually (laughs) like they would call them to say yeah if they were going uptown or if like a new woman had joined their house or someone had left They would provide them with these updates. They would try to keep the noise down and so on. Um, And basically, if those rules were ignored, they would be brought in and face prostitution-related charges. So that's kind of for the police. The upside of just ignoring a law is that they can then just choose to enforce the law when things get annoying for them, right? Yeah. So the Royal Commission basically says, while the chief of police and the police board did in, did genuinely have good intentions, that they didn't have the authority to do any of this. Um, and that while the intention had been to minimize the issue of prostitution in Winnipeg, the word spread quickly that Winnipeg was a place where women could work unbothered. And that some women then came to Winnipeg from the U.S. and other places. Um, McRae says in kind of um, response to these um, accusations. He says, I intended to limit the number of the number and the keepers, but I was slandered and hectored so much since that resolution that since that time, there has been no attempt made to do anything but to enforce the law. The police cannot prevent these people from buying property. So as such, there had been actually no effort to restrict the number of brothels in this area. <laughs> <laughs> so basically he had this whole plan and then they were like, we're not actually going to let you have the power to do that. And so once again, (laughs) Chief McRae is annoyed. (laughs) Um, On the plus side, though, um, only a small number of sex workers were now working outside the designated area. Um, The big issue, though, is is definitely for residents living nearby, right? So men are stumbling into the wrong homes, accosting women in the area, also just like wandering around drunk. Um. The commission does also find that the charge about alcohol is true, that women were so so the magistrate actually has been um, part of this as well, presumably, because women were repeatedly charged for selling liquor illegally, but the fine was never increased as it should have been. Oh, right. So it was supposed to be a hundred dollar fine the first time, then a second time it would be more. Right. But instead, what they're doing is just every three months pay us a hundred dollars and we kind of won't bother you about the alcohol. So essentially it's a permit. Uh, Totally. A (laughs) hundred percent. It's a permit, which is only available to brothels, which is very weird. (laughs) So, um, that becomes a big scandal because the police chief, um, collaborated with a madam to set up a red light district without the knowledge of the public. And then sell booze illicitly. And sell booze illicitly. And then lied to the public about this. (laughs) So, it sounds like everyone was lying to the public, though, not just the police chief. That is actually my biggest takeaway from this, is the way city government was working at this time, and in particular, like, matters to do with, like, the law and the police was so, like, not transparent. I'm trying to imagine the city trying to, like, establish a new neighborhood right now and trying to do it covertly in a way that wouldn't go horribly, horribly wrong for everyone <laughs> on city council. Yeah, that's the other thing here is, like, the idea was that because it wasn't right downtown that, like, reformers wouldn't notice. But that seems <laughs> dumb. Like, of course people are going to notice. Okay, also, reformers at the time were predominantly trying to go into working class neighborhoods like Point <laughs> Douglas. That's the place they go to do their reforming. <laughs> a really good point that I hadn't thought of like of course they were going to be noticed I don't know why they thought that it wouldn't come out it probably would have been better just to say hey we're doing this and we don't care that you don't like it right 
or just like couch it enough weird like hidden terms that no one can understand what they're saying or that yeah (laughs) but no like even in the previous ones like with the with the colony street brothels and the thomas street brothels like the police commission is never actually releasing any of these resolutions (laughs) they're just like we're doing something about it don't you worry you know (laughs) Yeah, so this is a big deal in all the papers. Um, but the funny thing is, even after this becomes like the big thing in the next mayoral election, um, William Sanford Evans, who's like pro, so they refer to it as segregation, which is confusing. What oh, it yeah. is like a segregated area in which prostitutes live, right? So it's it's a yeah. I I'll just be- put a piece together <laughs> that <laughs> So in the Ginger Snooks episode we did last time, there was a bit where they asked him what he thought of segregation. And I was like, I didn't even think about it. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what he's trying to say because it wasn't a debate in Winnipeg. And now I realize he was actually very pro red light district. Uh, you know what? That makes perfect sense for, for Ginger. He's just came together for me anyway. Anyway. Yeah. So Ginger Snooks and the mayor both. <laughs> Ginger bought them all their uh, fur coats, probably, like you did with the nurses. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So he's actually re-elected. So, yeah. So apparently people can't be, like, that mad about it, I guess, right? And it's not that contentious. No. So I think it's another one of these things where, like, reformers and probably residents immediately in that area are pretty mad about it. But, like, the general public is like, eh. You know, would it be fair to guess also that reformers might have had more access to like media to grandstand with like their own uh, papers? And that's why we totally. hear more of their opinions. Yeah, totally. And I think also just that like the Tribune always took a kind of more conservative side on these kinds of things. Yeah. And so they're probably not printing the fact that like most people seem OK with this, you know, <laughs> that's also pretty neutral news. Yeah, it's not a great news news story. <laughs> people are fine. And it is genuinely a scandal that the chief of police was, like, not telling people about this. Yeah. Um, so the area after that election, I'd say, is largely kind of left alone for at least a couple of years. But it meets kind of a similar end to Thomas Street. So there are, again, because this is an area where people are coming and being drunk and that the police are kind of not paying attention to or like regulating because they don't really have the authority to do so without arresting people. Mm -hmm. Um, Then it becomes this kind of bastion of crime. And there are several murders in the area, unfortunately, um, largely of sex workers. Um, Most prominently, though, in April of 1912, a sex worker named uh, Giselle Roberts, who's known as Mignon to her friends, is found strangled in her bed in a brothel in McFarlane Street. So Roberts was found by a friend of hers, Marie. Uh, She had been bound at her hands and feet with linen towels and with an additional towel around her neck, which appeared to have been used to strangle her. Um, Her friend then woke the keeper of the house, uh, Muriel Dulac, uh, who called for the police So the police come quickly, uh, but the two men who Dulac was able to describe had apparently left some time previously. She had kind of noticed them like leaving in a hurry in the morning, but hadn't thought too much of it until until um, Roberts was found. Roberts had also been robbed of about one hundred and sixty dollars, which appeared to have been um, motive here. Um, A police officer is quoted attributing the violence to the drunken men who visit the segregated district. He's quoted anonymously. Um, Police initially say that they're confident they'll solve this quickly, but nothing seems to come of it. They arrest some people and then let let them go. And despite Giselle having been a sex worker and also French, she's really treated quite sympathetically by the local papers, which is interesting. She's, yeah. And actually, I have to say the Tribune, like, despite not treating things with like all that much like nuance and sensitivity, I think (laughs) do generally treat sex workers fairly sympathetically in that they say they print things like these women need support. But she's described as being um, a pretty girl of about 26 from Montreal. And they really don't dwell on like what her occupation was. Oh, yeah. 
and, you know, are, are really intent. And I think a lot of people are on hopefully finding the, the culprit, which as far as I know, I, I didn't look too far into it, but as far as I know, he was not. Um, and so that obviously brings about a, a kind of human cry that, you know, these ought to be shut down. So spring 1912, there are a number of raids, uh, very similar to the Thomas Street raids, where all the women are kind of gathered up and brought in. Um, however, the district is not entirely shut down as Thomas Street had been. Um, I guess maybe there were just more of them. They're not quite as successful in doing it, but it does kind of take on a lower profile. Um, the madams realize that if they're going to stay open there, they have to kind of tone things down a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, no more being in a kimono out on the porch or whatever. <laughs> um, and so it sort of slowly dwindles after that. But the area actually doesn't entirely die until the 1930s when the brothels um, fall victim to what many Winnipeg businesses fall victim to, Great Depression. Oh, wow. That's what actually kills the red light district. That's what kills the red light district. So not all of these raids, not the many, many scandals or reformists yelling about white slavery. It's just people don't have as much money anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the most the... boring outcome to the end of it. But <laughs> I'm sorry, should I have ended with the murder? <laughs> <laughs> no, this makes more sense. Yeah, it's a much more Winnipeg story too. That's just like they went out of business. It's kind of peters off with a shrug. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah, so that's the red light district. Um, it was a weird thing to research, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's been a bunch of really interesting things written about this. Um, I'll have a whole bunch of things to put in the source notes for this week. Yeah. Any final thoughts? That was really interesting. I knew some of it from tours, but I feel like I only knew stuff about Point Douglas. So I learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes well, me sound like a huge nerd. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Well, you're very welcome. Yeah, I had seen a couple articles claiming that like Point Douglas was the only red light district. And in fact, it was our third. So <laughs> what a city we live in. Yeah, we're really we just couldn't make up our mind whether we wanted one or not. And city planning is just a hot mess. Yeah. Oh, actually, here, I'll end on a fun fact for everyone, which is that I've been saying red light district. But in fact, they were explicitly banned from having red lights. Huh. <laughs> So uh, on that fun fact, um, thank you very much for listening. Sabrina, do you want to tell people where they can follow us? Yes, because you don't remember I any, never, of, our, I never remember, remember any of our handles. <laughs> so you can visit our website at onegreathistory.wordpress.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at One Great History, and we're on Twitter at the number one Great History. All right, and we'll see you soon. Bye.